and the 48th verse. Acts 13.48 for our message from the Word of God this morning. You'll find Acts 13.48 on page 1168 if you're using the church Bible this morning. This morning being October 23rd, 2022. Our text this morning is going to be in Acts 13.48 through the end of the chapter and into chapter 14 and verse 7. And the title of this morning's message is Hearing is Believing. <laughs> You've all heard that seeing is believing. Well, this morning, hearing is believing. And we begin with the story of two boys who were talking one day. And one of them said to the other one, The police came to our house last night and accused my father <clears throat> of stealing from his job at the highway department. Well, at first, I refused to believe it. But when they opened up the shed in his backyard, all the signs were there. <laughs> the stop sign, the one-way sign. <laughs> all right, well then there's the shorter story of a Buddhist monk who saw what looked like the face of Jesus in his tub of margarine. And seeing that, he said, I can't believe it's not Buddha. <laughs> yeah, <there you> go. <laughs> well, speaking of believing things, here in Acts chapter 13, the Apostle Paul has just finished preaching the gospel to a bunch of Gentiles and they believed it. I direct your attention at this time to Acts 13.48 where we read these words. And when the Gentiles heard this, when they heard the message Paul preached, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Now, to begin with, doesn't glorifying the word of the Lord sound like something that maybe we should be doing? <laughs> So what do you say we find out how they were doing that so that we can do it too? Paul told the Thessalonians in your first reference in uh, 2 Thessalonians 3.1 <clears throat> Pray for us that the word of the Lord may be glorified even as it is with you. Now there, I think it's safe to say that Paul was asking the Thessalonians to pray that as he was out preaching the word of the Lord, that it would be believed as it was with them. That means to glorify the word of the Lord means to believe the word of the Lord. And hey, you already did that when you got saved. And you continue to do it when you come here every Sunday. And you continue to believe the word of the Lord when we're studying it and teaching it. 
And do you know what we do when we glorify the Word of the Lord? Amen. We praise the Word of the Lord. My dictionary says the word glorify means to praise. And the Bible uses it that way too. Look at Psalm 50 and verse 23 where the psalmist says, Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. And that means now you know what to say when somebody asks you if we have praise services here at Faith Bible Church. <laughs> now listen, what, what they mean by praise service is a service where they praise the Lord by singing without any message from the Word of God. Paul and Mary Ballback used to go to a church that was talking about having services like that once a month. No teaching from the Word of God. And that's when they decided to come here where they could praise the Lord by studying it and believing it like we're talking about here. <clears throat> now all of that also tells you what to say when you get asked do you worship at your church? <laughs> now what they mean by worshiping God is getting all emotional and passing out on the floor. But the word glorify by definition also means to worship. And that's how it's used in the Bible too. Look at your next reference in Psalm 86, 9 to 12. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name. And he says it again. I will praise thee, O Lord, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forever. You see, all those words, worship and glorify and praise, they're what we call synonyms. Remember learning about those in school? They all mean pretty much the same thing with some subtle nuances of difference. And in your next reference, the Lord Jesus Christ said, in vain do they worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Well, let me ask you. If teaching bad doctrine worships God in vain, then teaching good doctrine must worship Him in truth, right? Amen. So when we study the Word here, we worship Him, we glorify Him, and we praise Him. So the next time you get asked if you worship at your church, ask the person who's asking you if they'd like to come to your church for some real worship and praise and glorifying of the Lord, right? But now, when verse 48 ends by saying that as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, that makes it sound like God ordained only some people to eternal life and people who weren't ordained to eternal life couldn't believe. And that's how some preachers preach that verse. But you know what? That would make God a monster. God doesn't decide who will be saved. Men decide if they want to believe and be saved and keep from spending eternity in hell. But if that's so, what does verse 48 mean? Well, listen. Up until the Apostle Paul was saved, the only people ordained to eternal life were Jews. The Savior himself said in John 4.22, 
salvation is of the Jews. Now, that didn't mean all Jews were saved. It meant that only Jews could be saved. If a Gentile wanted to be saved, he had to become a Jew. Because only Jews were ordained to eternal life. Only Jews could be saved. But, beginning with the ministry of the Apostle Paul, Gentiles were also ordained to eternal life. Now that doesn't mean all Gentiles are saved. It just means they don't have to become Jews to be saved anymore because Gentiles are ordained to eternal life too. Now, if you're not sure what I'm saying, it helps to understand that one of the dictionary definitions of the word ordain is to prepare. Matter of fact, that's the first definition in my old dictionary. And we see it used that way in Psalm 7, verse 13. Speaking of God, He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. He prepared? No, he ordaineth his instruments of death. He ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors. We see that word ordained mean prepare in the next reference too in Isaiah 30 and verse 33. For Tophet is ordained of old. Yea, now that word yea I italicize because it's important. It means I'm about to tell you the same thing using different words. Yea, for the king it is ordained. No, for the king it is prepared. He's made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord like a stream of brimstone doth kindle it. Now if you know your Bible, you know Tophet is one of the Bible names for hell. And as it says there, hell was prepared for the king. The king of this world, just like it says in Matthew 25, 41, where it talks about <coughs> Ever, I'll get it out. Everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. After Lucifer sinned, folks, God ordained that he should go to hell. And he prepared hell just for him. That means God never intended for men like you and me to go to hell. God never intended for men to join Satan in hell. But men join Satan in his sin and his rebellion against God. And because of that, men have been going to hell ever since. But if men in the Lord's day got saved, they could go to another place that God prepared. You read about that in... Matthew 25, 34, where it talks about the kingdom prepared for you, you believers, from the foundation of the world. And that's talking about the kingdom of heaven on earth, folks. But that kingdom was for the Jews. It's the place God prepared for the Jews that he ordained to eternal life. God predicted that place in your next reference back in 1 Chronicles 17.9. I will ordain a place for my people Israel and I'll plant them and they'll dwell in their place and watch now, shall be moved no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness waste them anymore as at the beginning. Well, that's talking about the kingdom too. 
The only place Jews will ever be where they'll never be moved away from is that kingdom. Now, look back at that two references ago to that Matthew 25, 34 verse. And tell me when God began to prepare the kingdom for the Jews. Doesn't it say from the foundation of the world? That is also when God began to tell the Jews about the kingdom he was preparing for them. In your next reference, in Acts 3.21, Peter called the kingdom the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So to sum it up, God prepared and ordained the kingdom for Israel and he spoke about it to them through the prophets since the beginning of the world. Now, compare all that to what Paul tells us Gentiles in 1 Corinthians 2.7. We speak the mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God, what's that next word? Ordained before the world unto our glory. Before the world began, God ordained and prepared something for us Gentiles that the prophets didn't talk about. Paul says in your next reference in Romans 16.25, the mystery was kept secret since the world began. Now if you didn't follow all that, study it next week in the bulletin because it'll help you understand your next reference which is a really puzzling passage if you don't know all that. Paul says in Romans 9, 18 to 24, Therefore, speaking of God, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy. What if God might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore before prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, who used to be the only people ordained to eternal life, but also of the Gentiles. That passage, listen folks, that passage is, when it talks about God having mercy on whom he will have mercy, that's not about him choosing to have it on one man and choosing not to have it on another. It is about God choosing to have it on the Gentiles as well as the Jews. He has prepared a way for Gentiles to get saved as well as Jews. He ordained Gentiles to eternal life as well as Jews. And once the Gentiles here in Acts 13.48 heard Paul tell them about that, they believed and got saved, and then they went out and told the other Gentiles about it. You see that in the very next verse, in verse 49, back in your Bible now. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Now when you and I think of the word publish and publishing something, we think of printing something, right? But you know, you don't need a printing press to publish something. My dictionary says the word publish means to make something public. Or, or to make something known that was unknown. That's how it's used in Amos chapter 3 as well. In verses 7 to 9. Speaking to the people of Israel, it says, God revealeth his secret unto his servants. God has spoken. Pop. 
publish it. Publish it in the land of Egypt and say, and then it goes on. Now that verse is talking about how God revealed some secrets to his servants, the Jews, about the kingdom. And they published it and, and made it known. But when Paul came along, he revealed the mystery that was unknown. And these Gentiles here, they published it by making it known throughout the region, as it says there. They went around saying, Hey guys, now God has a message for us Gentiles. We're not chopped liver anymore. God's got a program for us. But the Jews who didn't believe Paul's gospel, they didn't like it when the mystery was published. So back in your Bible, it says in verse 50, the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable men and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. Now listen, don't be confused by that word devout there. The word devout does not mean saved. It just means devoted. It's the noun form of the adjective devoted. <laughs> you thought you left nouns and adjectives behind in school. Oh no, you gotta keep those in mind when you're studying the Bible. Those women in Antioch were devoted to some God or other, but not to the true God, not to the God of the Bible. So what you're seeing there in verse 50 is unsaved Jews stirring up unsaved Gentiles to do their dirty work. You know, like they did when they stirred up the Romans to do their dirty work and crucify Christ. But Paul and Barnabas, they, didn't let them they did not let that bother them. As you see in verse 51, back in your Bible. But Paul and Barnabas shook off the dust of their feet against them and came into Iconium. Now, if you know your New Testament, you know that shaking a city's dust off your feet is... <laughs> well, that's what the Lord told the twelve apostles to do if the Jews wouldn't listen to them. He told them in Matthew 10, 14, Whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. It was, it was a symbolic measure, or um, um, gesture, I should say. So when Paul did that here, it was his way of saying, I've been thrown out of better regions than this. <laughs> if you don't want God, God doesn't want you. And he shook off their dust. God does not force himself on anybody, folks. Now, up in verse 48, that verse we started in, we saw that these Gentiles were glad that Paul preached to them, right? And now, in the last verse of chapter 13, we, we see that these disciples, they weren't just glad. The disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Ghost. They were filled with joy and gladness. Just like you were when you got saved, right? Now here I want to add something about verse 52. I, I've heard some grace preachers say that that word disciples only refers to Jewish kingdom saints and not to members of the body of Christ. But boy, I, I look at that. It sure seems to me that there it's referring to the members of the body of Christ that the Apostle Paul just led to the Lord. Now, I know verse 52 also says that 
they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And that means they spoke in tongues like the Jews did at Pentecost. So it's tempting to think that these were Jews or these disciples were Jewish kingdom saints. Until you remember that during the transition from God's program for Israel to his program for us, he gave members of the body of Christ miraculous gifts like speaking in tongues. But he stopped giving gifts like that 2,000 years ago. I know people today claim they have them, but you remember what I always say about that, don't you? God's gifts are often imitated, never duplicated. <laughs> So you can either go to an imitation church where they imitate those gifts or you can come here. That's your choice. I'm glad you're here this morning. You made the right choice. Now, you'd think that after these Jews started persecuting Paul that he'd quit preaching the gospel. But some guys just can't take a hint. <laughs> So, verse 51 says that after Paul and Barnabas shook off Antioch's dust, they came to Iconium. And in chapter 14, we find out what happened to Paul in Iconium. Verse 1, came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, him and Barnabas, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. Now, here you see that Paul must have been targeting really big synagogues to have great multitudes responding to his messages, right? But when verse 1 says that they so speak in a way that a great multitude of Jews and Greeks believe. That makes it sound like Paul was such a, a polished speaker that oodles of people <laughs> believed when he spoke. And that makes people like you and me think that if we could be as polished and eloquent as Paul, well then we'd have oodles of people <laughs> believing when we preach too, right? The problem with that is we know Paul wasn't a polished speaker. Look what he says about himself in 2 Corinthians 11, 6. He said, I be rude in speech. Now, that word rude today means impolite, right? But years ago, it just meant unpolished. So we know here in Acts 14, it wasn't Paul's eloquence that made all those people believe. It was what he said. He preached grace to those people. People. <laughs> And the Gentiles believed because all of a sudden salvation was available to them. And the Jews believed, not because of his eloquence, but because Paul didn't preach what Peter did at Pentecost. At Pentecost, Peter blamed the Jews for crucifying the Lord. He said, you did it and now you need to repent of it. But that is not God's message for Jews today. God's message for Jews today is grace. The Apostle Paul didn't tell those Jews, you did it, and now you need to repent of it. He said, God did it. He did it for you. And now you need to believe it so you can be saved. And you know what? You could preach that too. You could preach grace. You don't need to be a polished speaker to get people to believe. 
But you do have to open your mouth and say a few syllables like Mo used to say to Curly. Remember that in the Three Stooges? Curly would get knocked in the head and knocked out and he'd say, Speak to me, kid. Say a few syllables. <laughs> well, that's what we got to do. Say a few syllables. All right. After that multitude believed, you're never going to guess what happened in verse 2 of Acts chapter 14. Sure enough, same old thing. The unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. The unsaved Jews in Iconium did the same thing the unsaved Jews in Antioch did. Got people all riled up against Paul and Barnabas. See, you would think that Paul would leave and look for greener pastures in other cities. But he still hasn't learned how to take hints. So it says in verse 3, Long time therefore abode they in Iconium, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Now, I got to tell you, that is a pretty impressive therefore don't you think? It was because those Jews got people all riled up against them that Paul decided to stay there and take the heat. I don't know if you know this or not, but you can measure your commitment to serving the Lord by measuring what it takes to stop you from serving the Lord didn't let anything stop him from preaching the word of God's grace and we're not going to let that anything stop us either. I'll do my part as long as you keep doing your part. And together we'll keep doing what Paul did. Of course, when verse 3 says the Lord testified to what Paul preached with miraculous signs and, and what, that made people wonder. Signs and wonders Maybe you're wondering why God doesn't do that for you. I mean, why doesn't he give us the strength we need to work miracles to back up what we preach? Well, believe it or not, I think he actually does give us the strength to work miracles. Just a different kind of miracles. Look what Paul told the Colossians in Colossians 1 verses 9 to 11 he told them we do not cease to pray for you that you might walk strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto unto what unto the power to work miracles listen before we read the next reference you need to know that that's how God showed his glorious power in the Old Testament by miracles. Look at the next reference in Exodus 15, 1 and 4. The Lord has triumphed, what's that word? Gloriously. How did he do that? Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. God showed his glorious power in the Old Testament, folks. By, by parting the Red Sea and drowning Pharaoh. So here in Colossians 1, you'd think Paul would pray that we'd be strengthened to God's glorious power to do stuff like that. That's not what Paul prayed. In Colossians 1.11, it says he prayed that they would be strengthened according to God's glorious power unto all patience and long-suffering. You know how God shows his glorious power today? It's when believers like you are patient. Folks, we need to be patient and put up with the wickedness of this world with all their abortions and gay marriages and stuff. 
We just have to, to suffer long with all of that and know that God's going to put an end to it in the kingdom. Listen, he's going to show his miraculous, glorious power again at the second coming of Christ when he puts an end to all of that wickedness. And you're thinking, well, how come he doesn't do it now? How come he doesn't show his glorious power now by ending all that wickedness now? Well, he could, and someday he will. But, listen, he shows greater, more glorious power by being patient and not ending it. You say, well, how's that work? Well, let me ask you the question the Pastor Stan used to ask back when they had boilers and boilers that would build up these tremendous pressures inside. He used to ask, when does a boiler show more power? When it explodes and takes out half a building? Or when it contains the tremendous powers building up within it? Well, you know the answer to that. Let me ask you a Bible question. When did David show more power? When he killed Goliath or when he refused to kill Saul? I know it looks like God showed more power when he, when he overcame the forces of nature at the Red Sea. But you know what? Even mere mortal men can overcome nature. We did it when our Army Corps of Engineers reversed the flow of the Chicago River. They, did, they had the power to do that a hundred years ago. We had the power to overcome nature when we built the Hoover Dam. Even men can overcome the power of nature. It takes far more power to overcome the power of human nature by making a man patient. Because we don't naturally like to be that way, do we? But God can do it. So don't, so don't be sighing for the Lord to, to back up your testimony to the world with, with miracles like the Red Sea. You can show far more power with your patience with all the sin in the world and all the people in the world and you can show far more of God's power with your patience when some knothead believer crosses you. Or does that never happen to you? <laughs> yeah. Believers need to be shown God's power too, don't they? And how it can work in their lives. If they can learn to be patient too. You say, well, but pastor, people still don't believe when I, when I show God's miraculous patience. Well, you know what? Some people didn't believe when they saw Paul's supernatural miracles. You see that in verse 4 of Acts chapter 14. After verse 3 says that God granted signs and wonders to Paul to testify to his words. Verse 4 says, but the multitude of the city was divided. Part believed what Paul said. Part held with the Jews, but... I'm sorry, part held with the Jews. Part held with the apostles, Paul and Barnabas. Now listen. The first thing I want you to notice about that verse is that the whole city was not divided over politics. Do you know why? Because Paul didn't preach politics. He preached the Word of God's grace. And just imagine what would happen if all preachers preach grace instead of politics. Just imagine if all grace preachers did it. People would finally be divided over something eternally important for a change. 
And hey, there's nothing wrong with dividing people. It's what the Lord did. Look at Luke 7, 43, 9, 16, and 10, 19. Got to skip around here. There was a division among the people because of him. There was a division among them. Chapter 9, verse 16 says. Chapter 10, verse 19 says, There was a division, therefore, again, among the Jews. Truth always divides people, folks. It divides people into those who believe the truth and those who don't. That's not your problem. We get accused of dividing churches all the time. Because <laughs> we preach grace. We preach the word of grace like Paul did. And some people hear it and believe it and leave their church. Well, amen. That's how you know you're doing it right. If you're getting the same results Paul got when he taught, you must be teaching what he taught, right? I guarantee you, if the Son of God couldn't figure out a way to preach the truth without dividing people, you're not going to figure it out either. You say, but Pastor, grace is dividing my family. Some believe and some don't. Well, I don't mean to sound harsh, but so what? That's the reason God sent His Son into the world, as it says in Luke 12, 51-53. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth? I tell you, nay! This is Christ speaking. But rather division! For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided. Three against two, two against three. Sometimes more believe it, sometimes less. The father will be divided against the son. The son against the father. The mother against the daughter. The daughter against the mother. The mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So when you, when you share grace with your family, and it divides them, some believe and some don't, just say, bless God. I'm accomplishing the purpose for which God sent His Son into the world to accomplish. Amen? Now, it might break your heart if your family members don't believe. But I'm sure it broke the Lord's heart. In John 7, 5, it says, Neither did His brethren believe in Him. But He didn't let it get Him down. You could tell by what happened in Matthew 12, 47 to 50. One of them said to him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, wanting to speak with thee. And he answered and said unto the, him that told him, Who is my mother? Who are my brethren? And then he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples. And he said, Behold! my mother and my brethren for whosoever will do the will of my father which is in heaven the same is my brother and my sister and my mother I got to tell you I share that passage of scripture probably at least a half dozen times a year when I hear from believers who email me and say they are heartbroken because members of their family don't believe the gospel. I remind them they've got a church family. That's where Jesus Christ took his comfort and that's where you got to take it too. If that's your case. Finally, in the last three, three verses of our text in Acts 15, verses 4 to 7, it says... Uh, verses 5 to 7. And when there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews, with their rulers, to use Paul and Barnabas despitefully and to stone them, and that's how you know who was behind it. It was the Jews who stoned people. 
Then at verse 6 it says they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derby. They weren't afraid to take the heat. They just didn't particularly want to die at that present time. They wanted to keep preaching. They fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, and unto the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. Now, backing up to verses 5 and 6 there, we have to ask, why does it have to say Paul became aware of an assault that was made on him. I mean, wouldn't you know if you were being assaulted? <laughs> well, once again, look up words in the dictionary. There is a difference between assault and assault and battery. Did you know that? In law, an assault is made when you raise your fist and swing it to deck some dude. It only becomes battery if your fist lands and finds the dude's nose. So that means here these men assaulted Paul by planning an attack. And he became aware of it. And then he wrote what he said in your last reference where he talked about all the persecutions and afflictions which came unto me at Antioch and at Iconium and at Lystra. Persecutions I endured, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. But how did the Lord deliver him? Did you notice here in verse 6 in, 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 our, in the Bible here, it doesn't say how he became aware of the, the, the plot they were, uh, uh, assault they were plotting against him. Now, it might have been because he had the power of a prophet. Remember, we've talked about that many times. Prophets just supernaturally knew stuff like that. Like in Acts chapter 5, when Peter knew what Ananias and Sapphira were plotting behind closed doors, right? But it's also possible that Paul became aware of it by God using the body of Christ as his informants. All I know for sure is now that there's no more prophets, that's the only way that we can be made aware of plots against us and stuff like that. And that, folks, and yeah, I'm almost done. I know what's getting late. That is another example of how God now uses us to do the things that he used to do with miraculous means. And knowing that, that'll keep you from being disappointed when God doesn't do miracles for you and he doesn't act like you think he should. And it'll also get you to get off your royal derriere, so to speak, and let God use you to serve Him. Because you know what? If you will, He will use you in ways more powerful than those miraculous means. We've seen it today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the challenge that you have issued each one of us this morning. I pray, Father, that our people and all listening to this message on our internet or watching our video, all of your people will do what Jeremy Bilka did years ago and come and say, I want to start this kind of ministry in our church or that kind of ministry in our church. God in heaven, use us. God in heaven, lay it on our hearts to make ourselves available to you so that you can show your glorious power to the people that we come into contact with. And we pray it in the Savior's name. Amen. Blessed be the time